Okay. Good evening, everyone. So welcome to our first of two nights on the resurrection of Christ. Um, obviously, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't really require an explanation why we're doing this series or in the Easter season. And so we thought we would offer two nights that were open in the calendar to reflect over Christ's resurrection. So I'll be kind of leading you tonight, uh, looking at the scriptures. And then Father Pacomius, next week, will lead a reflection more theologically, uh, but sort of um, about Christ's resurrection and the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas. So um, for those, uh, we, we have extra Bibles. Um, for those of you at your table, if you don't have a Bible, you might want to grab one from that table. And you should have, there's a handout at all the places. And it's, if we have any more people that come up, then we have places for. Maybe uh, those of you can help make sure they get situated. And you might have to set up an extra table, some extra chairs too. So if you could help, that would be great. And for those tuning in online, you can find the handouts on the home page. So if you go to, to our homepage, you'll see there's a little link. You can click on it, and you can download tonight's handout. So that will be reference, and that will be handy. And also, you, um, you'll want to have your Bible with you, too, because we'll be referencing that a lot. Let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the resurrection of your Son, bringing us newness of life. We pray that you help us to appreciate the power of his resurrection, that it might be uh, more evident and effective in our lives and uh, in our church and world. And we ask that you be with us in the series and guide us always through your spirit. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of the Resurrection, pray for us. All the holy angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so the resurrection in the New Testament. So there's a lot here, um, and I've tried to summarize and give you a resource with this handout. Um, even though this kind of led talk or, or discussion is on the resurrection in the New Testament, I did want to include a few things about the Old Testament. Um, because Jesus himself speaks about how his life, death, resurrection is all foretold in the scriptures. And so um, I have sort of have some bullet points up here at the top about where you can find uh, hints of Christ's resurrection or things pointing to it in the Old Testament. Um, so you might, you might think that Okay, in order to find Christ's resurrection in the New Testament, naturally, if you're familiar with the Gospels, you realize it's the end of the story. So the first place you might be tempted to look is right at the end of each Gospel, and you would be correct, right? So we find resurrection narratives at the end of each Gospel. Mark 16, Matthew 28, Luke 24, and John is actually the last two chapters. So usually the last chapter is all about the resurrection in each of the gospel narratives. For John, you have two chapters, chapters 20, 20 and 21. So 20 is about his, a, a couple of appearances in Jerusalem, and then 21, you have a unique appearance in Galilee. So, but... There's a lot more that's said about the resurrection than just the re in, in the res what you find in the resurrection narratives in the, in the New Testament. So if you, just, if you just think a little bit more, right, you realize that St. Paul references the resurrection often as well. So you could have this interesting exercise in which you go through all 27 books in the New Testament, and that's what I did recently, <laughs> and you sort of comb through and looking at every explicit reference to the resurrection of Christ. Now, you might use modern technology to help you, right? You type in resurrection. However, if you did that, you would get a certain number of references, but you would not get them all because different words are used. Sometimes it says, God raised him from the dead. And so the word resurrection is not, as a noun, is not there, but the verb, he raised him. Or 
He is risen. That's a different verb. So you have to, you have to know the language and the variations in order to do in-depth searches. In the end, though, it's, it's best to be familiar with the scriptures enough so that you can um, recognize where the resurrection is being referred to or implied. But even this would not be sufficient. Even if you found all the right language and you looked at all the, the references to the New Test in the resurrection in the New Testament, even this would not capture, capture Christ's resurrection in the New Testament. Why do I say that? Because every single book in the New Testament was written after the resurrection and after the ascension, and it's written in light of the resurrection. So in a, in a sense, it's all seen to be flowing from and to be in light of the resurrection of Christ. And this is a powerful, saving, life-changing, history changing, epic event that for, it should be for everyone, but for the New Testament writers, this shapes everything. Uh, everything, it, you view everything differently, your lives, history, the world, everything is seen differently in light of the resurrection. And all of these books are written in different circumstances, the different communities, but all in light of the powerful, the powerful event of the resurrection that is central to all of them. So even when the resurrection isn't explicitly mentioned, it's always there in the background as a kind of source of grace and inspiration for the New Testament. So that's worth saying. Um, and, and so many things, every, everything connects to the resurrection in some way. Without the resurrection, there is really no Christianity. Um, and even, G and even St. Paul says this, if Christ is not raised, our faith is in vain, and we are the deadest of dead. Okay, so those, that's a, that, those are some basic points. Um, it's also pretty striking to think about how the books that we have are not written hundreds of years after the, the claimed event. You know, in, in, if you're talking about other figures, whether it be Buddha, or it'd be Genghis Khan or something like that. Usually, the works written about these figures that most historians would consider historical, are, if you look at they're usually hundreds of years after when they lived. And so, but in the New Testament, we're dealing with something very different. So Christ lived on earth in the first part of the, the first century, right? The New Testament the books, we, we, we think the earliest ones are written in the 50s, so a little less than 20 years after the resurrection of Christ. And we think the last ones are written still before the first century ends. And so all of the books in the New Testament, basically we have reason to believe, were written in the second half of the first century. And many of the original witnesses were still alive especially at the beginning, and even towards the end, at the last book, we have reason to believe St. John was still alive. We even have writings, early church writings, of people, of references to people who knew St. John the Apostle and heard him preaching when they were children, like St. Polycarp um, and St. Ignatius of Antioch. So we have these kinds of references um, in the early church. Even St. Irenaeus, who goes into the 200s, he, said, he knew St. Polycarp, and St. Polycarp lived to like 87 years old, something like that, and St. Polycarp heard the preaching of John when he was a child. So, which is so interesting that even with St. Irenaeus going up to the 200s, you still have only one link away from an apostle. So, this is pretty striking, and there's, there's a really good book on this called The Eyewitnesses by um, Richard Balcom. It is kind of, it's a kind of scholarly work, and it goes into detail in terms of you know, the power of this point. So you have the eyewitnesses still there overseeing the whole process, and so the books in the New Testament are written really by either eyewitnesses or those who knew the eyewitnesses. So you're very close to the original event. 
And so the power of that original event comes through these writings. And again, it, it's, it, it suffuses all of them. And so that's just worth um, you know, sitting with. Um, now what we find in, is sort of different material. So if we, if, we go, if we look then to the explicit references to the resurrection in the New Testament, you can start to, start to categorize some of these things. And so you have what we, one category would be the resurrection narratives. And those would be at the end of the Gospels. Um, you could argue that there's something like that in 1 Corinthians 15 um, at the beginning, which we'll look at. But you're basically given mostly um, the end of the Gospels. So four, maybe arguably five resurrection narratives that give you some details about the resurrection. But there are a lot of references that just pro, are, I would call what would call proclamations. And you'll see this a lot in the Acts of the Apostles in what we call, um, you'll see a lot of what we call the kerygma there. Kerygma means proclamation, and kerygma is thought to be the initial proclamation of the good news. And it's a proclamation of what God has done through Christ and especially in his love through the de his death and resurrection and saving us um, and showing his love through that, that, those events, that paschal mystery, as we call it. And so you'll see this proclamation, God raised him from the dead, as we'll see many, many times through the Acts of the Apostles. Um, you can, you'll find it in St. Paul, where he'll just mention Jesus, whom God raised from the dead, or who was raised from the dead. And so it's, it's not just, when St. Paul says these things, it's not just, oh, it's at this, by the way, this is a descriptor of fact, but it has emo some emotional power, spiritual power, emotional power there. It's, it's a proclamation of, of powerful truth and good news. And so you have, the, the New Testament basically is permeated with these proclamations of the resurrection. It's, it's there's emotion behind it. Um, because it's something that moves, they, they, that uh, the apostles were moved by and the, and, and the early disciples. And so every time it's mentioned then, it's not just right, a factual statement, but it's charged with spiritual imports and um, a powerful emotional experience, fittingly. Now you see some of these proclamations in the resurrection narratives so I have that at the, the bottom of page one here. And you, the, those, are, those are sort of the first proclamations. So you have the angels um, basically telling the women, giving the first proclamation. So from Mark, do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, who was crucified for us. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, as he told you. So he has risen. You will see him. Right? Very powerful, short statement. From Matthew, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead. There you will see him. I love this question from, and the angel says in Luke, why do you seek the living among the dead? <laughs> he is not here, he has risen, but has risen. Remember that he told you this while he was in Gal Galilee. He must rise on the third day. And then Mary Magdalene actually has the first non-angelic proclamation. She says, I have seen the Lord. After she meets him, that's sort of this initial proclamation of good news to the disciples. Um, and traditionally, we call Mary Magdalene the apostle to the apostles, apostola apostolorum. Uh, and that's one reason she's kind of one of the patron saints of us, we Dominicans too, because she's this kind of apostle telling the good news. Okay, so you have the resurrection narratives, you have the initial proclamation, you also have this other subset of resurrection verses which speak to the 
theological significance and power of the resurrection, the significance for us. So there's a little bit of articulation or explanation. He, it's not just that he's risen, which is powerful enough, but this is what it does for us. So we'll look at the, that as well. Um, all right, let's, be, uh, before we go on, why don't we just um, take a look at the Old Testament. So if you remember, when Jesus appears to the two disciples, Cleopas and the other one is not named, it could be Peter, it could be somebody else. You could argue either way from the text. But Jesus basically was opening up the scriptures to them and showing that his sufferings and resurrection were all foretold in the scriptures. Now, we're not told which verses he, he referred to. Um, but early on in, in his ministry, you'll see that he references certain things that that um, do point to the resurrection from the Old Testament. And um, the fathers of the church, uh, the faithful throughout the centuries have reflected over a lot of this and found all kinds of things in the, in the Old Testament that point to the resurrection of Christ. What are those things? So this is, I don't claim that this is exhaustive, but these are some of the main ones um, that I found. So do you remember the, the story about Isaac, um, where Abraham was commanded to sacrifice his son Isaac? Well, there's a kind of implication to resurrection there. Um, now, because God promised to multiply Abraham's offspring as much as the stars of heaven and the sands on the seashore, but now he's the very son that he's had through whom all these descendants will come. Now, before, before Isaac gets married and has children, he's, Abraham is asking him to sacrifice him. So this... Does this make any sense, right? If you sacrifice Isaac, then how, how, is he gonna, how is he gonna have descendants as numerous as the stars? <laughs> so Abraham doesn't understand, but he trusts and he, he just obeys and then the angel stops him and says, okay, you pass the test. Um, but interestingly, in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 11, nine, you feel free if you wanna turn there. Uh, that's, Hebrews is in the New Testament, by the way, if you didn't know. We'd be tempted to think it's in the Old Testament, but it's, it's in the New Testament. So in Hebrews 11, 9, it's this great, Hebrews 11 is this great chapter that highlights the power of faith and especially referencing the examples of the, the heroes of the Old Testament. I'm sorry, this is, uh, yeah, 11, 19. We'll start in verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was ready to offer up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your descendants be named. Now get this verse. He considered that God was able to raise men even from the dead. Hence, he did, he did receive him back, and this was a symbol. So, of course, Isaac was not actually killed, but... Abraham thought, well, if he sacrifices Isaac, God still can be trusted, so he must raise him from the dead, right? And then, then he'll have descendants. So it's kind of an interesting thought here. So there was the, there's a sense, that, and then he receives him back, even though he wasn't killed, and there's a kind of symbol of the resurrection here that Hebrews says. Um, we, question, yeah? Question is what was question was what was Isaac's relationship to Abraham after that? Um, I think they um, well, it's a good question. I think he was. I think we probably got over it. Oh, that's interesting. So Vesna said that, and that's, that's, we have reason to believe that Isaac is younger, was younger and stronger 
and so could have resisted, but he, he went along with the plan. <laughs> so, <laughs> had a happy ending, though. Um, there are also other things like the typology of Joseph. So Joseph is kind of a Christ figure. He's one of the most righteous figures of the Old Testament. He, gets, he is betrayed by his brothers, sold for silver. Sound familiar, right? He's a kind of Christ figure. He's thrown into a pit. It's not the pit of death, but it's this sort of pit. Um, he's taken out. He's then brought into prison through a false accusation, like Christ was, put in jail like Christ was. He's condemned with two others, one of whom is saved, one of whom is not, like Christ. But then he's raised, and he's vindicated, and he's made. He's put at Pharaoh's right hand, and he's second only to Pharaoh, because he interprets Pharaoh's dreams, and then he feeds, he helps feed the world in a time of famine. So he's, he has this sort of uh, descent and then exaltation in the end that that whole pattern of descent and exaltation can be seen as a kind of uh, figure. He's a figure of Christ in that descent, which is similar to Christ's death, and then his vindication and exaltation in Egypt at the right hand of Pharaoh you know, uh, as a kind of symbol of Christ, too. There's Aaron's staff that, w that bl blossomed. And so the, that's in number 17. The, the story there is um, they had various claimants to, for the high priesthood, and they all put their staffs, in, I mean, their staffs, their staff is a dead stick, right? Put it in the ground, and Aaron's miraculously blossomed. So it was a stick that was alive, and then it died, because it was a dead stick now, right? And then it comes back to life again. And that's the symbol of Christ, the high priest. Aaron is the, the, like the, the type of the high, he's the paradigmatic high priest, the first high priest um, of the Old Testament, um, and sort of the symbol of Christ the priest, as we see in the book of Hebrews. And so that staff that died and, and sort of blossomed again is a symbol of Christ that the priest rises from the dead. Um, in Job, if you want to turn to Job, Job you usually find before the Psalms. Job 19. Twenty-five and following. For I know that my Redeemer lives, in context, the Redeemer is God. And at last, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, then from my flesh I shall, I shall see God. So you have this sense of after death, I shall still see God. Um, but my Redeemer lives. Uh, you can see this, kind of, this points to um, the Christ resurrection as well. You can think of the hymn, I know that my Redeemer lives. It borrows from this language of Job. Psalm 2.7 2, is referenced in the New Testament with regard to the resurrection. Uh, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. It's Begotten is kind of thought here, is begotten from the grave. You kind of come to life again from the, the, the grave. And then 16.10 is, is about you will not let your Holy One see corruption. And so Jesus, this is sort of thought of to be from the lips of David. Jesus is the new David. And even though David died and saw corruption, but this verse points to Christ, who would be the new David, who would die but not see corruption. So this verse is in the New Testament is applied, is seen as a prophecy of Christ. Psalm 22 starts off, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what Jesus begins praying on the cross. So he's praying various psalms on the cross. And that, it speaks of that psalm, if you look, has some of the details of the passion. His hands and feet are pierced, he's mocked, he, his uh, clothes are, so, are, are, are um, sold, are divided, I mean. So you have a number of the details of the passion that you see in this psalm. But if you look at the end of the psalm, there's vindication of this suffering figure. And that's, you can see that as a symbol of the resurrection. Psalm 118, 
The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Christ refers that as that, as that he refers, he sees himself as that cornerstone in, in, in the parables. A few might remember that parable. Um, so he's the stone rejected by the builders, but in the end is vindicated and becomes the cornerstone, the most important stone of the building. And that connects to the symbol of the church as well. So you can see a lot of verses from the New Testament that reference that, but that's the, its origin is Psalm 118, verse 22. Jonah. So Jonah goes three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, and then he is saved from the whale. And Jesus references that as a symbol of his de death and resurrection. Then Hosea 6.2 you get extra points if you can keep up with me. <laughs> After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. So in context, this is talking about Israel after being stricken. Uh, but So there will be this time period in which kind of remain in death, but then the Lord will revive after two and a half days. And that's literally the time period of the resurrection, right? Christ dies on a Saturday, on, on a, a Friday, um, and then on the third day, which would be on a Sunday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, he will raise him up after two days on the third day. Isaiah 53, we read that on Good Friday. That is all about this mysterious figure who is righteous but suffers. And there are a lot, this is similar to Psalm 22, there are a lot of details that connect with the passion. But you also see that this figure is exalted and rewarded. And it's very clear that this figure dies, and yet he will be exalted and prolong his days. So if you look at the, um, the beginning of the passage actually starts at the end of chapter 52. So in Isaiah 52, the first thing it says, behold, my servant shall prosper, he shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. But then, it's be, it's, and so you might think, okay, why is he being exalted? This is this great figure. But then you see he actually suffers. And he even says he, pours out, he poured out his soul to death. And he was falsely accused. And he was, you know, he was scourged and led like a lamb to the slaughter. And he opened out his mouth. But if you look at the end, starting in verse 10, yet all of this was the will of the Lord. And he shall see his offspring, not his physical offspring, but his spiritual offspring, right? All his disciples, that's us. And prolong his days. The will of the, of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the fruit of his travail and of his soul and be satisfied. He makes many righteous. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession, intercession for the transgressors. So there you have resurrection in the, in the very, in very Psalm, in, in Isaiah 53, which Jesus applies to himself in various verses. He sees himself in this figure of Isaiah 53 and the New Testament in various places also highlights that. In Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel has this vision of this valley of dry bones. So it's, it's this like graveyard and all, right, it's just dead, not even bodies, just bones, dry bones. And yet you see this vision of God's spirit coming and hovering and, and, and all of a sudden sinews come, come back to these bones and they're all made into living human beings again. So you have this whole image of resurrection in Ezekiel 37. That's, that points to the general resurrection at the end of time, but it also you know, points to Christ's resurrection. He never had those dry bones, right? His body was still there, but Daniel 12, uh, 2 and 3 speaks about a resurrection of the righteous and of the unrighteous at the end of time. So again, a general resurrection. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. 
And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. In 2 Maccabees, there's reference to the, the resurrection, especially when you have, there's a famous passage of seven sons who go to their death in faithfulness to the laws of God, and even the mother of the seven sons goes to death. And if you look, if you look at these verses, then you'll see references to the hope of the resurrection and, and receiving their bodies back and being rewarded by God. And then the last point I have here from the Old Testament is you can see, you can find the resurrection in various narratives um, on a larger scale, like the res, you know, going down to the Red Sea and coming back up is seen as a bapt, as like a symbol of baptism, you know, through through our Christian faith in the New Testament, and so and going down into the in the Red Sea is kind of a symbol of death and coming up from it you can see as a symbol of resurrection, or the exile, going to the exile to Babylon as a kind of death, the restoration coming back and the rebuilding of the temple is a kind of resurrection. And every time there's somebody vindicated like Joseph or Elijah or others, you can see they're, you know, on the one hand they're persecuted and, um, and misunderstood and but then they often are vindicated in the end, and uh, that vindication you can see also as pointing ultimately to the vindication of Christ in the resurrection. So this isn't exhaustive. I'm sure that you can find many other things, but so this, this would be, though, maybe a start of finding the resurrection in the Old Testament. All right, so one, one other point that I'd like to make when going back, moving back to the New Testament then, which you can see said that the resurrection doesn't, the resurrection of Christ then in, in Christ's own understanding doesn't come completely out of the blue. Uh, it was foretold. It's part of the plan of God um, in the Old Testament. It's pointed to, it has many images and typology in the Old Testament. Um, so this made it easier for the Jews to perhaps, if, if they had an open heart, for the Jewish people to accept the resurrection. They already believed that there would be a kind of resurrection at the end of time. And so, but here's the challenge is Jesus, in his, the mission that he gave the apostles, he said, go make disciples of all nations. And most of those nations are non-Jewish. And in Greek culture, they didn't quite have the same notion of the body and the human being as the Jews did. So it tended to be more Platonic. And Plato is from Greece, where the, in many cultures, the body is something almost like a prison that you're in, and you want to be freed from it. So there's this is very, very common in cultures. Life is, is hard. Um, and you know, as we have our own hardship, but it's a lot of it in our culture is sort of first world problems. Um, but life for, for, for many people throughout history was incredibly hard, even harder than if, if we're going through hardship. And so people didn't look forward to any kind of like great material existence with any suffering attached. It's almost like they wanted to really escape from it. So any, pretty much every nation had some kind of view of the afterlife, but in almost every case, it's you leave the body and material, the material world behind, and your soul sort of escapes from this bondage of the material world. And so the, to be resurrected, reunited with your body, is a very kind of repulsive concept. It's not something that would have been popular. And... So the, the Greeks were okay with the afterlife. Some believed in reincarnation, like Plato, but it, it's generally the, the desire is to leave the body behind. But interestingly, Aristotle had a little bit of a different approach. He, did, he, saw, he saw the human being more as a sort of unity, body-soul unity. And 
which means that's, in, that, that's kind of who we are as distinct creatures as human beings, the body and soul. So his notion was a little closer to the Jewish notion because the, the Jews uh, believed in the soul, but um, the body was something sacred. And the Jews would bury their dead um, because the body was sacred. And the, you know, we are made in the image and likeness of God body and soul, and principally the, you know, through the soul, but the body kind of shares in that in some way. And so burying the dead, you know, is we, in Christianity, we consider it a work of mercy. Uh, if you go to Rome, you'll find that there are catacombs. The catacomb, there are some Jewish catacombs and there are some Christian catacombs. But notice it's only Jews and Christians. Okay, there were, there were, some, in, in, there were some Egyptian practices where there would be mummification and burying of the dead. But generally, the Romans, they cremated the body. Um, so they wouldn't go through all the trouble of having, you never, you didn't have Roman catacombs. It was for the Jews and Christians because of that reverence of the body, towards the body. So here's the thing with Aristotle, you actually have something that's much more compatible with the Jewish notion of the, the unity of the human being of body and soul. And so with Aristotle, death is very unnatural. It's like, you, with your, your soul still exists, because it's, he would say, subsistent, um, but your body disintegrates, but your soul depends on your body, so you can't really be conscious for Aristotle apart from the body. So it's kind of this weird thing in which you have these souls that exist, but they're not, they don't even know they exist because they can't be conscious with, without sort of the brain, or you know, self-conscious without the brain. So there's this kind of floating intellect, and it's very strange, right? And so for Aristotle, reunification of the body, as long as it was in a happy existence, would have been a much uh, more appealing thought. So there were strands of thought uh, in Greek thought that would have been a little more welcome to the idea of resurrection. But you see when Paul goes to Athens and to other, some of the other Greek cities and he's preaching the resurrection, um, it's interesting if you look at Acts 17 when he goes to Athens, it's very interesting. Um, the, the people in the Areopagus, kind of the elite, they liked people coming in with new ideas and they liked hearing new things. And so they're like, oh, this guy, is, he's got some I new ideas. We'd like to hear from him. And then he starts speaking about the resurrection. And they're like, hey, I think we'll, we'll talk to you. We'll, we'll see you some other time about this. <laughs> it's kind of a polite way of saying, okay, I, I think we're, we've, he did, we've dismissed him. Now, he, they did re he did receive some converts after that. But it's interesting. After this, he goes on to Corinth. And at Corinth, he takes a different tactic. He's just a very confrontational preaching Christ crucified because <laughs> he's like no longer trying to win over the Greeks through reason because he, he sees, you know, because of his experience in Athens. Um, so he's, he's just being more bold and relying on the, the power of Christ and not so much philosophical argument, it seems. Although what he says in Athens is still interesting. And, and um, so... So there's a big challenge in, in preaching to the Greeks. But still, even the Greeks, even with their, their notion, they, when they see the miracles, when they hear, when they see changed lives, when they see, um, when the witnesses are credible, then those who are open, you know, uh, become great and zealous converts to the Christian faith and those in other cultures as well. And you see Christianity spreading. So despite the kind of bias against the whole idea of resurrection in Greek culture, generally speaking. So that's, that's kind of an interesting thing. So that's kind of the context when you see when the, the gospel is being spread in the Acts of the Apostles, when you read about the letters of St. Paul, um, you see these kinds of issues coming up. All right, so let's look at page two. So in terms of explicit references to the resurrection, this is everything I could find. I might have missed something, but I, I, you'll notice all 27. I just put the Gospels. The Gospels are four books, right? But besides that, it's all 27 books just listed off one after another. And I've just listed, tried to, sought to list every verse that references the resurrection explicitly in some way. Some, it's, it's a little more implied. Um, 
And as I mentioned, sometimes you find narrative, sometimes you find the proclamation, sometimes you'll see the explanation of the significance of the resurrection. I do like to highlight that it's not just, in the, when you look at the Gospels, it's not, you won't find resurrection only at the end of the story, though. Jesus actually predicts his resurrection. So one of the things you see is, um, among the miracles of Jesus, one of them is raising people from the dead. And you'll find this, um, Jesus actually refers to this when people send a, a little contingency um, to, from John the Baptist. He sends a group kind of to ask, are you the one who is to come? And one of the things Jesus says is um, he speaks about the signs of the Messiah and the miracles that happen. And one of the things he mentions is people are raised from the dead. And so Jesus himself acknowledges that this is something he does. He raises certain people from the dead. And so you see, you hear about that generally in two verses in the Gospels. But then there are three specific individuals that you hear that are raised from the dead. One is the daughter of Jairus, and you see that in three Gospels. Then there's the widow's son at Nain, and that's only in the Gospel of Luke 7. And then you have Lazarus in John 11. And that's kind of the most, uh, like most impressive because Lazarus has not just, been, not just recently died, but he's been in the grave for, wrapped up in bandages, dead for four days. But then you find in the Passion Predictions, uh, so when Jesus begins predicting his Passion halfway through his public ministry and then begins making his way to Jerusalem for the last time, three times along the way he predicts his Passion. But we call them Passion Predictions, but if you look closely, the resurrection is also mentioned. So Christ will, be, he will suffer, he will die, and on the third day be raised. And so you find that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the second passion prediction in Luke doesn't mention the resurrection, but it does in the others. And you can basically, that's the only one that doesn't mention, but every other instance mentions the resurrection. You also find it in the parable of Lazarus and Dives. That's in the Gospel of Luke. So you remember there's the rich man, he's, that's Dives. So Dives in, in Latin means rich, wealthy. So there's the rich man. And Lazarus is kind of outside his doors, his door, and he dies of starvation, and the rich man doesn't do anything to help him. And then the rich man also dies. And then he winds, Lazarus winds up in heaven, uh, Dives in hell, and Dives then is speaking to Abraham, and he says, please go tell my brothers and warn them. They, they don't want to come to this place of torment. And... And then the response of Abraham is, well, they have Moses and the prophets. They already kind of know. They know better. But then the Divi says, but, but if someone raises from, is, is raised from the dead, then they'll, they'll believe it. And then he says this kind of cryptic message, you know, even if someone would ra be raised from the dead, they, won't, they still won't. If, if Moses wasn't sufficient, neither would they be persuaded if someone should rise from the dead. Right? That's an impl implication of Christ. Uh, from his own lips, in his own parable. In John 17, Jesus uses this language, I lay down my life for the sheep. This is the Good Shepherd chapter, and I take it up again. So laying down is a way of speaking about his crucifixion and sufferings, and then taking up again, a way of speaking about his resurrection. And this is long before the passion and resurrection. And then when he, I already mentioned this, the cornerstone, the stone which the builder has rejected has become the cornerstone, right? That's the symbol of the resurrection. Remember when he cleanses the temple in the Gospel of John, and he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will rebuild it, and they're thinking he's referring to the temple, the actual temple, but then it, it, the text explains he was speaking about the temple of his body. There you go, another reference to the resurrection long before it happens. So, and then you have the resurrection narrative that I mentioned. So I just like to highlight that. So in the Acts of the Apostles, you mostly find this proclamation, God raised him from the dead, as I mentioned, the kerygma. You'll see if you just look through these books, there are certain books that don't have any explicit reference to the resurrection, but it's implied. Um, and it's always in the background. Um, 
What I'd like to do is take a look at 1 Thessalonians. So if you flip to 1 Thessalonians, the reason I want to look at this is because to get some taste, little sample of some of the texts you'll find in the New Testament that reference the resurrection. The reason I'm going to 1 Thessalonians, who could guess why? Is the first book of? Correct. Well, we're pretty sure. Scholars think that it's the first book of Paul, but it's also, they think, the very first book written in the New Testament. So all 27 books, they're, we, they're not in order of when they were written, but most scholars think that this is the earliest scroll book that was written in the New Testament in, early, in the early 50s. So let's look at the very earliest writing in the New Testament written within 20 years of the resurrection because this, is, this will be the earliest written references to the resurrection. That's why I like to look at 1 Thessalonians. So verse 110, so right at the, it's towards the beginning. To wait for his son from heaven. So that's a reference to the second coming. Whom he raised from the dead. Again, it's like that proclamation. He, he raised, God raised him from the dead. Jesus who del delivers us from the wrath to come. And then let's look at 414. So St. Paul here is addressing a particular concern in the community at Thessalonica here, and that is, uh, has to do with the resurrection. And he says, well, starting in verse 13, we, we would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are asleep, those who have died before us, before the, those that he's writing to, that you not grieve as others do who have no hope. So not to grieve without hope. We should always grieve with hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So, death and resurrection of Christ is proclaimed, the, the paschal mystery, and that's, that's kind of part of the kerygma, and the significance of the resurrection, it gives us hope. Because God did this for his son, and those, so through his son, he will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So we get to be kind of caught up in the train of Christ. And, and we will be raised. And then, verse 10, he speaks about, God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we wake or sleep, we might live with him. So it's kind of implied there, just as Jesus died and rose, so we are with him whether we die and then when we rise. We die and rise with Christ. So right there in the very earliest document, you have not a lot of details, but you hear the proclamation of the resurrection. So I, I won't, I'm not going to go through all of these verses. Um, these are things you can always look up on your own and pray over if you just want to meditate on the power of the, of the resurrection. What I would like to do then is, um, if you look at page three, I'd like to work up to the significance of the resurrection, but let me point out a few things on, on, on page three. So this language of God raised him from the dead, you'll find in all these verses. And I've separated all the ones in Acts, since there are a lot of in the Acts of the Apostles, and then the rest of the New Testament, the same language is used. So those are all the verses. But then there's this other language, Christ was raised, like the passive voice. And you'll find that in these following verses. With the resurrection narratives, um, You'll find common elements and unique elements, too. And sometimes people get bothered because they're not sure how it all gels, and it's kind of hard to figure it out. But I don't think um, but the, what, makes, what makes them very interesting and credible 
is that you can see how independent they all are. And yet when you see that things are so independent, but you see the common elements, um, that, like say you had a car accident, right? And then you had five people that were purporting to the police of what happened. And they all have a little bit of different take because they have different perspectives and details. But if you hear the same like five points from each one of them, that gives you pretty, a pretty good confidence that those five points are like true, right? So some of the common elements are striking. The, the empty tomb, the women first encountering Christ, their sense, the disciples initially don't believe them, um, but then, then they themselves see the Lord and they're not kind of, it's hard for them to believe, but Jesus is trying to use all these proofs to show them very physically, like here are my wounds, I'm going to eat in front of you, touch me. Um, and he did it many times to many different disciples, right? All of this is a way of proving with overwhelming evidence that this is real. Because you can't be fuzzy about this. Like we think we saw him. Are you sure you saw him? I think I did. If I remember right, um, no, it's like, and it's, they can't just wishful thinking. I really hope I saw him. It's like Jesus is going out of his way to impress the, the reality of his resurrection on his apostles. Um, so that, that lends power to um, those main elements. How all the details mesh, I wouldn't get too worried about that. Um, But they're all, each, each gospel is kind of unique in its own take, too. What about the place where these, let me, let me say a few things about that. So when Jesus, first of all, okay, where was Christ crucified? A place called Golgotha, right? Now, where is Golgotha? Outside Jerusalem, good. But how far? Good answer. Okay, so let's look up John. John actually tells us. So John 19.20. Many of the Jews read this title, the title of the sign of Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, where Jesus was crucified was near the city city is Jerusalem. So John is telling you very explicitly that where Jesus was crucified was near the city. It's not some far out place. Now interestingly, the place where the Holy Church of the Holy Sepulchre is today, um, there was a question up until modern times. Was it, is that place within the first century or outside of the first century walls of Jerusalem? Now the walls of Jerusalem have shifted over the centuries. And so, can, but scholars finally figured, out, it, figured it out in the 20th century, and they found where the first century walls were. And guess what? The Holy Sepulchre is outside, but just very near outside the city walls. So it corresponds exactly to what John says here. Now what, what okay, so that's where he was crucified. Now what about where he was raised? How far was that? Is that like a distance? They took him to like another place? Or is it close by? Who says far away? Who says close by? Okay, the second, the second people have it. Uh, <laughs> so verse 41, 1941. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb where no one had ever been laid. So it's like the gen same general place. And interestingly, if you go to the whole Church of the Holy Sepulcher, both places are in one church. One is kind of up higher, that's the place where they mark where he's crucified, and one place is lower, and that's where he, they, so it corresponds, right? And some people actually claim, it's, it's actually a serious claim that those could be the very places where Jesus died and rose. And, and why do you say that apart from this? It's because the Emperor Hadrian, in the year 135, built two pagan temples over the very places that were revered by the Christians as the place of the crucifixion and resurrection. And you'd think, wow, what an insult, right? Like, how sacrilegious and, and how offensive. But 
in the end, the trick was on him because by those temples, he forever marked those places. So when those temples were destroyed and, you know, churches were built, they were built on those same spots. So it's very unlikely that those spots would have been confused or mixed up between in 100 years. So by the time 135, with all the, the witnesses that, you know, lived, people would have known that those were the places. So we have, we have probably a good reason to believe that when you visit the Holy Sepulchre, those are actually the places where Jesus was crucified and was raised. Okay. Um, how long did, would, did Jesus rise from the dead? Forty days. Okay, so he says forty days. How many think, people think he's correct? How many people think shorter time? How many people think a longer time? How how long did Jesus appear to his disciples as raised from the dead? Okay. No, sorry. How long did he appear as risen from the dead? He says forty days. Now, how do you know? Okay, you learned it. Not sure where. Same here. Does anybody know where we get this tradition of 40 days? Paul's letters, no. Forty days he was in the desert, so maybe they applied that 40 to the resurrection. Good guess, but not quite. You are correct. You're correct. It's in there somewhere. Well, I'll give you a hint. I'm, I'm surprised Maria doesn't know because the answer is right here. <laughs> so it says duration. Where it says duration, Acts 1.30. So at the beginning of Acts. I'm sorry, it should say 1.3. Sorry, 1.3. Scratch out that zero. I'll just start from the beginning. In the first book, what's the first book? Luke. In the first book of Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commandment through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To them he presented himself alive after his passion by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking of the kingdom of God. So, it's not something we just made up or, or like thought or put together. It's actually very explicitly told to us right here. And, interestingly, Jesus was crucified right around Passover. And the, Pente the Feast of Pentecost is about 50 days later. So Jesus appeared more or less for 40 days, right? And then, and then the Pentecost, 10 days later. So that's why we, we know that um, basically he ascended on the 40th day, and then 10 days later would have been the Jewish feast of Pentecost, on which the Holy Spirit came with, on the apostles and early church in the upper room. And there's good reason to believe it, it was actually on a Sunday, too. Uh, that will be for another <laughs> lecture when we get into that. But um, so, but that's the, the apostles. Jesus said he told his disciples to wait after he, before he ascended to go to Jerusalem and wait until they were clothed with power from on high. So they all go back to the upper room where the Last Supper happened, and they just kind of hang out there and pray intensely for nine days, or ten days, you can say, on the tenth day. Like, there are nine in between days, between the Ascension and Pentecost, and that's why we had the first novena. Novena means praying intensely for five, nine days. So it's praying for the Holy Spirit to come, and then on the tenth day, the Holy Spirit comes. So, and that's on the Jewish feast of Pentecost, and now it becomes a Christian feast, kind of builds on and completes and fulfills the Jewish feast of Pentecost. So, now, you can also find all kinds of verses about the ascension in the Bible. Um, and so, 
I have a couple of references to the Old Testament, but there are more there that you could connect with the Ascension. And then I have all the verses that I could find. There are probably more that connect with the Ascension in the New Testament. So that's a particular event, but it's, it's, with, it's part of the resurrection, right? And then you have this, um, along with the Ascension, this, this language of Jesus at the right hand of God the Father, right? Um, so that's his place in heaven, right? He's exalted at the right, you know, we, it's basically the language of the ancient world is the person that's, that's, that you would exalt and you have, you know, who you would put to your right. Um, and so this is sort of language that's used, that Jesus is exalted with the Father um, and from there he reigns and, and graces us. Uh, interestingly, there are some post-ascension appearances. So we think of Jesus appearing over that 40-day period and then he ascends. But in the New Testament, you actually have various appearances of Jesus after the ascension. And there are four that I could find. There's one to St. Stephen. So if you look in Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, 756. I'll start with uh, chapter, or verse 55. But he, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So he sees a vision of Jesus and he says, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And then they stone him to death, right? And then he says, Re- receive, Jesus, receive my spirit. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Verse 59. So you have this appearance of the risen Jesus to Stephen. You have the appearance of the risen Jesus to Paul. You can look that up on your own. There are three different times in the Acts of the Apostles where he recounts his conversion story and how he was persecuting the Christians and then Christ knocks him off his horse. Now, the horse is not mentioned in Scripture, but there might have, there might have been a horse. Caravaggio shows it um, and many other. <laughs> so whether he had a horse or not, he was knocked, right, knocked to the ground and his life was changed. And then he, he went from being the, one of the biggest opponents to being one of the biggest advocates and missionaries and... and greatest apostles in the early church. You can also see him referencing it in 1 Corinthians a couple of times, in Galatians, Ephesians. Paul actually speaks about other appearances of Jesus to him. He speaks about that in 2 Corinthians 12. And then um, in Galatians 2, 2 as well. There's this interesting verse in Galatians, his, Paul, his letter to Galatians. Galatia is somewhere in Turkey. My, uh, um, Asia Minor, which we call, in the ancient world, we call it Turkey today. So in 3.1, St. Paul says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. So he doesn't really explain that, but the Galatians most probably were not there at the crucifixion. So there must have been some kind of vision in which they saw Christ crucified in some vision. That's what it seems to be he's referring to. We're not quite sure, but... And then John has a a revelation. Christ appears to him for the whole book of Revelation. And you see that especially Jesus speaking to him through chapters 1 through 3. And then you see this vision of Christ on the white horse um, in chapter 19 towards the end. But then this figure of the lamb that is like the central figure of the book comes up all throughout the book, starting in chapters, chapter five, I believe, four or five, and I think four, actually. And that that lamb is Christ. And so this, his vision of that lamb is sort of an appearance of Christ. So so you have these post-ascension appearances. And of course, after all of that, right after the New Testament, you know, Jesus has appeared to various individuals like Mary has throughout the centuries, too. All right, um, with the time remaining, what I'd like to do is just kind of um, refer you on page four to some of the chapters that highlight the significance of the resurrection. So where I think you can especially see this is in the, the following chapters, Romans 6, Chapter 6 and Romans 8, those are very powerful chapters. Romans 6, it starts off with St. Paul saying, you have been, basically you were buried with Christ in baptism and raised to newness of life. And so you're called to sort of um, 
be dead to sin and, and live a new life in him. Um, and then he speaks of living, the, the things that are involved with that newness of life. And say, this chapter 8 is kind of similar, but it's got its own unique um, themes. 1 Corinthians 15 is all about the resurrection. So he, St. Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and they have all these questions about the resurrection. What kind of body will it be? Will it be physical? Will it be a spiritual body? And so St. Paul is trying to answer those questions, and he re refers a lot to Christ's resurrection, and that is the cause of our resurrection um, and, the, and grace in our lives. Um, 1 Peter in the whole book of First Peter, you have various references to the resurrection, and that's often read in the Easter season. So it's interesting, um, in the liturgy, after Christmas, we read especially from First John, the first epistle of John, because the, there's such a strong and powerful theme of the incarnation in that letter. And after the Easter season, we especially read from First Peter, and Revelation, too, and Acts, because those kind of all um, sort of unfold the power of the resurrection. So First Peter, in, and Peter mentions in his letter um, the power of the resurrection in various places. So those are things you can look at. Let's, let's just look at one, one example, and let's look at Colossians 3. Now, Colossians is one of the short books of Paul after Philippians only four chapters. Now, with regard to uh, if people speak about the morality of the New Testament, um, you can find like you can find moral ideals all throughout, but there are certain places where you find a lot of those ideals in one place, like the Sermon on the Mount, right? But and Colossians three, like Romans twelve, is another chapter. And Colossians three, you have a lot of the ideals of the Christian life captured here in Colossians 3. So this is a great chapter just to read and reflect over the various aspects of holiness to which we're called. Even though we all fall short, it's good to be attracted to that and let the Lord attract you to that and pray for those, you know, for progress and so on. Um, so, for example, if you look at verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, and patience, forbearing one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, and put on love, and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as you teach and admonish one another, and sing psalms and hymns, and everything you do, do in the name of Jesus, right? They're like all these amazing, like, um, ideals, all captured in one place, and before that, put to death, Verse 5, put to death whatever is earthly in you, immorality, impurity, and passion, so on. So it's like put to death um, through, you know, all, these, all these, these forms of sin, right, and then live all these ideals of God and virtue. But notice where the whole chapter starts. Look at the very beginning of the chapter. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So it's not just moral exhortation, like do all of these things. The whole context is Christ's resurrection has enabled you to live a new life and is now with you in grace. And you're called to cooperate with that grace and live those ideals by the power of his resurrection. So that's an important like beginning and preface to the whole chapter. So everything, all the ideals of holiness, we can't just live on our own. You know, we will, we, we falter. We have to rely on Christ, right? And so, but all of these ideals of the Christian life, of holiness, of sanctity, all flow from the resurrection of Christ and the grace we receive from that. So, um, but you can see these bullet points that kind of tries to summarize so you, you, some of the, you know, Christ was raised in order that we may bear fruit for God. He was raised so that he might intercede for us at God's right hand. We're saved if we believe and confess in his resurrection. Uh, we're called to die, die and rise with him. Um, and so on. And there are a couple of connections to baptism there as well. We don't really have time to get into the objections. Maybe next year we can look into um, the apologetics for the resurrection and all of that. Those, that gets really interesting. Um, let me just end with these summary points and then I'll take questions or thoughts from you. But 
Uh, I already mentioned all the books in the New Testament were written in the second half of the first century, and the witnesses were still alive. The New Testament is unanimous in its claim that Jesus was really raised bodily to an indestructible life. So he, it wasn't just resuscitation. He lived never to die again and never to suffer again. Um, the resurrection of Christ is a central claim in the New Testament and is a revolutionary and saving event for humanity. All are called to respond in repentance, faith, and baptism to the resurrection of Jesus and to let the resurrection of Christ empower them to live in newness and holiness of life. The resurrection of Jesus point, gives us hope and points to and will cause the future resurrection to eternal life for believers. So I hope, I hope this has been helpful as just a, kind of a, an overview and just giving you, it, it also gives you a resource that you can take with you as we're continuing to live this Easter season so that and meditating on the reality and power of the resurrection that it will become more power, powerful to us um, and help in living uh, the newness of life of the resurrection. Okay, so um, questions or thoughts? When do, you th when do I think St. Stephen died? It's a good question. I don't know. Probably in the 30s. It seems the first few chapters of Acts I mean, it's, and it's before St. Paul converts. I forget when he's, when the year where it was estimated that he probably would have converted. We don't know for sure, but I think you can kind of put some things together. And um, So he, he converts shortly after that in chapter 9. St. Stephen is put to death in, seven, in chapter 7. So um, my guess is somewhere in the 30s, in the decade of the 30s. The first century. Young man named Saul. So that yeah, the first martyr. He's my confirmation saint. <laughs> What are, is there anything, uh, you might have to think about this, but is there anything that in particular over, over what we've gone over that strikes you? Maybe you didn't think about before. Yes. 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 He, so the question was, um, you were struck by the nine days yeah. between the ascension of Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And yes, that is the original novena. Okay. So if you look at the Acts of the Apostles um, in Acts 1, then they returned to Jerusalem. This is verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away, which is the opposite mountain. I've been there. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. So that's in Jerusalem. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, so all the apostles. All of these, with one accord, devoted themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So you have, it's not just the apostles, but it's a lot of early disciples. They're all kind of huddling there in the upper room. And then... Uh, when the day of Pentecost had come, this is chapter 2, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound came from heaven like the rush of a mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributed and, and distributed and resting on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So that's on the Jewish feast of Pentecost, which would be on the 50th day. So in the Easter season, we're reliving that whole time period, right? That's why we celebrate Ascension Thursday on the 40th day, which is which what, what I love about this diocese. It keeps Ascension on Thursday. Everything's messed up when it's, it's like delayed, right? And you kind of lose the sense of the novena. 
I had a, I had, I know there was a priest in the past where people asked, why, why are we celebrating the ascension on Sunday? And the priest kind of joked, he says, well, his flight was delayed. <laughs> but no, he ascended on Thursday, so. The Sabbath day's journey is a very short period of time because you could, on the Sabbath, you could only walk a certain number of steps. Otherwise, if you, it was beyond that distance, it was work. So it's a very short journey. You can go from, you basically, one mountain to the next, and that's all you can do. You can go from Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives or back, and you can't go any further, right? That's, that's about a Sabbath day journey, so it's a very short distance. I'm not sure exactly how many cubits. Cubits, I think, are they say from your elbow to your hand or something like that, but uh, or maybe it'd be a mile or something, I'm not sure. I'd have to look that up and... Okay, well, I, I meant... Okay, so the, um, he asked about the... I have a note there about the audience for Jews versus Gentiles. So that's what I was trying to explain before is the Jews had some background of resurrection and it's kind of more in their ideas, their vocabulary, their thinking. They knew that God would ultimately raise people from the dead. And so that whole notion of us having our bodies back again is, is acceptable to Jewish you know, theology and, and faith. The Greeks, not so much. So it was actually a little, so um, now they were both were challenges. So of course, many Jews became Christians, but they were maybe skeptical of a new thing. Christianity was new, right? And this was resurrection. So there was a lot of hesitancy among many Jewish people because of that. On the one hand, so there was some hesitancy there of a, something new. On the other hand, though, they were more open to the whole idea of the resurrection. And actually, it depended. So the Pharisees and the... Yeah, because you, you, the Pharisees, there are different schools within the Jewish community, right? You have the Pharisees, and they believe in the resurrection. But the Sadducees, and they mostly ran the temple, um, and they generally st stuck with the Pentateuch. And there's... There's not much. I mean, there are things maybe you can say that are implied about resurrection in the Pentateuch, but not like really explicitly about the resurrection in the Pentateuch. And so the Sadducees tended not to believe in the resurrection. Um, but they were more like the aristocracy. And that's kind of why that when the temple was destroyed, Sadduceic Judaism really didn't survive because it was so dependent on the temple. Whereas Pharise the Pharisees had synagogues and they were just much more equipped to live their their faith in a temple-less situation. So, um, but at least the Pharisees and other schools of thought were open to the resurrection. And, and definitely the, um, uh, what's the group called? I can't think. The Essenes. There were another, so there are various like sects or groups of, of, of Jews. Uh, so some of them, I think probably most of them would be, except for the Sadducees, as far as I know, would have been open to the, res you know, the idea of resurrection. Um, whereas the Greeks, in general, um, would have not been open, because it's, just very, it's more foreign, that whole notion of resurrection. But despite that, you know, because of the truth of it, and, um, and it, did, it did, as I try to explain with Aristotle, um, with a more Aristotelian approach, it could actually, it could, it solves Aristotle's dilemma. <laughs> so, yeah, because we're not, it's not kind of right that we're having, for Aristotle, it's not right that we have a soul without a body, that we leave our body behind. That's not how we're supposed to be. For Plato, he's like, yeah, that's great. Leave the body behind, you know, get the, we get, now we get, we're free from that bondage, right? But for, for Aristotle, um, it's, he would have probably been more open. Yes. Okay. Yes. So the question is, was there more than Greece and Rome and going out to the Mediterranean world? Absolutely. So Ro Rome is just the empire, and they ruled a lot of em a lot of local nations, and they were mostly like city states, you could say. Um, and so there were all these different cultures, 
and they all kind of, they learned Greek, a lot of them learned Greek for the sake of communication, and that was kind of the lingua franca, so to speak, um, and the language of communication. So, uh, so the more educated people would have all learned Greek. Paul knew Greek. Peter probably, he might have known some Greek, but it probably struggled. Um, yeah, and but basically everywhere they're going around the Mediterranean world, you're, you're finding, I mean, even in Greece, there are all these different city-states and different cultures and Asia Minor. So Asia Minor would have been in the Roman Empire, but it was not Greece and it was not, but then in Syria and Antioch, you kind of, and then they go out east, right, to Chaldea, and art, like, you know, some people argue that, you know, it was, traditionally a lot of people say France was the earliest daughter of the church, but you arguably Armenia was actually the, had the first ruler um, to, to embrace Christianity. So, uh, and there were some places where the apostles went very early on, which is outside of the Roman Empire, and you have this tradition of St. Thomas, the apostle, going all the way out to India. Um, and so we don't really know the full extent of where the apostles went, but it, it certainly, within the Roman Empire, there were, it went to all these different cultures within, in North Africa, and you, in the Acts of the Apostles, you read about them going to these islands um, in the Mediterranean as well, and even to Spain, as far as Spain is mentioned in, in St. Paul's um, letter to the Romans, so I believe. And then you hear you have early, very early on though it's going out. Um, I mean even even um, even Alexander the Great went as far as India with his empire. You know the Roman Empire didn't extend that far, but there was the Silk Road and uh, so there were so yeah it was I, and so the so Christianity certainly spread uh, within the Roman Empire to many different cultures and certainly beyond it very soon, too. Yeah. And the exact timeline, I'm not fully sure with every, yeah. Now, one, if you find in the back of the Bible, the, some of the, a number of Bibles, I think these ones have them, you'll have various maps. And so they have, some maps will show St. Paul's missionary journeys. And you know, he's known to have like three missionary journeys. But it's not even... That's sometimes hard to figure out all the details, but at least you get a kind of general sense and you see where all the places he visited. So biblical geography gets really interesting. Um, and then you can explore, at least in the New Testament, all the different places that are mentioned. And sometimes you just hear about these places, like I have no idea where these places are. But the more you look at maps, you're like, wow, that's really interesting. He's in Turkey, he's in Greece, he's in Syria, going to Cyprus and, and Malta <laughs> and all these places that um, the gospel was brought very early on, and even um, at least uh, before I came to Ethiopia, it was that was very early on. You find an Ethiopian eunuch coming in Jerusalem, you know, in Acts eight, um, and reading Isaiah fifty three, and then Philip, the deacon, you know, explains that to him and preaches the gospel, and then he's baptized. <laughs> so it's like, did you? Yeah. Okay, great, great question. Yeah, so the, the question is, um, with all these, with these notions of the resurrection in the Old Testament, what 
was it they were only expecting this at the end of time? Um, with with coming of Christ, it didn't all happen with the coming of Christ. And so were they expecting two different things to happen, like the coming of Christ, his first and second coming? I don't think it's fully clear. And I think, um, you know, it's just like, uh, it's similar to the notions of the Messiah. If you, if, if people, people used to argue, okay, what, what, and they tried to spell out exactly what, what the Jews expected the Messiah to be. But the truth is there were actually lots of different notions of who the Messiah would be. And that's why you even see that in the New Testament. Some think people think, expect them to be a new Jeremiah or a new Elijah or a new Moses figure. And, and the, the beautiful thing is they're not contradictory. So there are many different notions and people weren't fully certain what the Messiah would be, a new David, right? And, and Jesus fulfills it all in the most perfect way. He is the new Jeremiah and, and David and so on. Um, with regard to the what we call eschatology, so there are, in the Old Testament, it's only kind of towards the later, uh, the, the later, later part of the Old Testament that you get more explicit eschatology. When I say eschatology, eschatos in Greek just means last. So it's the study of the last things, eschatology. It's a fancy word, right? Just comes from the Greek. But so a lot of the Old Testament is 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 about the past and of God's covenant or the present and what is God doing now. But then every once in a while, you'll find these things that point to the future. Now, it could be future on this earth, but then you find these other passages which seem to point to a kind of future beyond time, um, like the peaceable kingdom in Isaiah, where every all creation, you know, there's no more killing even among animals. And that just seems to be something outside of our experience in this world or the resurrection um, that Daniel refers to. So, and it's not, they, it, they don't tell you exactly. But this is where you see progressive revelation, right? So God slowly reveals himself. And what I find so interesting is in most cultures in the ancient world, pretty much them all, they, all of them, they had some notion of the afterlife. But the Jews, for so much of their history, didn't have any clear notion. And what I, that's so fascinating. So the, the very culture that believes in the one true God doesn't have much of a notion about the afterlife because God hasn't revealed it and they don't want to put words in his mouth. So you have kind of inklings of the afterlife, but it's kind of maybe later that, that, Jesus, uh, that, that the God begins to reveal to his people you start to see notions of the immortality of the soul that become clear and the resurrection of the body towards the older, the, you know, later on in the Old Testament. And you can see it all kind of leading up to Christ. And, and part of it is Christ needs to rise from the dead because none of us is worthy of entering God's life. So you can't really have a developed eschatology. You can have promises and fulfillment, but you can't really have much hope apart from Christ rising from the dead, right? So he has to go and like lead the Old Testament righteous into heaven when he goes into the, the realm of the dead. Um, the harrowing of hell is um, a lot of the, the Eastern traditions um, kind of love to think about. So, um, so I don't think there was full clarity in terms of what that would be, if it would be a new earth or would it be a new heavens, you know? Um, and then Isaiah speaks about a new heavens and a new earth and how this would happen. I think there's unclarity, but I think it all becomes clear with Christ because he brings about a certain amount. He fulfills a certain amount, but then he speaks about certain things are not only fulfilled at his second coming, right? All these, uh, the rising from the dead of most people and so on. So... So it's, it's, you kind of need Christ to bring that clarity. And so you have these kinds of notions in the Old Testament, but it's not clear how they all fit together into one big picture. And that's why Jew, um, like the, many Jewish people today, there are different strands of thought. And if you ask them about the afterlife, about the Messiah, you get a lot of different thoughts. And there's kind of uncertainty about right, a lot of that. Uh, so we would say that Christ brings that clarity and kind of fulfills that. Um, so hopefully that helps. All right, one last question. <laughs>
Um, good question. So the question is, what's the relationship between the resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit? Well, so the Holy Spirit has been at work since the creation of the world, right? And in the Old Testament, you see all kinds of inklings of the Holy Spirit. Um, so God's grace was certainly, you know, involved in the Old Testament. Um, but with Christ comes the fullness of grace because, and one of the marks of the Messiah is that he would bear the Spirit in its fullness. You see that in Isaiah, prophesied in Isaiah. And so you see that in the life of Christ. He bears the Holy Spirit and you see the power, the miracles and his, um, and then the Spirit comes from Christ to us. So it sort of overflows from the head to its members. And so, um, and so you have to have sort of the, so the Jesus teaches about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's already at work before Pentecost, but there's a kind of a special coming of the Holy Spirit um, of the church um, and through the sacraments like baptism. Like um, we're actually Father Bacomius will talk about the Holy give a presentation on the Holy Spirit next month in May in Aquinas. Um, but there's a lot about the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, right? And but I think the basic notion is. Um, Theologically, you have two processions in God. You have the procession of the Son, the procession of the Holy Spirit. But then those processions sort of are extended in time, and they become what we call missions. And so the mission, so the mission of the Son is the incarnation is coming on earth, right? And the mission of the Holy Spirit follows upon that. And it's not a different mission. It confirms it. And it's sort of the Holy Spirit is there to make Christ present and help us to fulfill um, and uh, so I think um, so I want to kind of keep this short because we want to ending up but um, maybe that's the short answer is, um, is it's part of the mission of Christ it's kind of and it's an extension and it helps us um, to make, it makes Christ present it helps us to live the mission of Christ uh, after Christ has ascended um, all right, so thanks. Hopefully this is uh, helpful for your meditation. Um, and may Almighty God bless you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, thanks everyone. <laughs>